Okay, great. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's it's good to sort of see you here, Dani. I know we've had like uh, a couple of conversations via email. Uh, and I guess um, as we were discussing in terms mm -hmm. of the concept of Almanac, uh, you know, uh, how are we actually thinking about education and particularly uh, what has kind of come in the space of alternative pedagogy, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the context of COVID, uh, how COVID has sort of, um, you know, the, the sort of intersections of environmental justice, uh, uh, of, of uh, various kinds of marginalities, like how, um, how all of this has sort of led to the creation of other kinds of spaces um, uh, of learning and unlearning, uh, of study. Mm -hmm. But I think what we can do first is to really actually think about like a far more basic question uh, in a sense, which is what is education and who is it for, right? Um, yeah. Because I think that might be an interesting sort of pivot to actually the rest of what we would talk about. So, so I don't know what, what like I would, I would kind of um, throw that to you, you know, to, to see how you think you're thinking about it. Yeah. And also in, in the context of, of course, India, right? Because um, I think that our, uh, the, the idea of like temporal political mm -hmm. contexts are quite uh, important when we mm -hmm. engage with these questions. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when we're talking about pedagogy, and uh, alternative pedagogical spaces, then I think the first uh, uh, point to begin with is what exactly do we have at the current uh, uh, space? So what, what exactly, what kind of pedagogical space do we have at this particular point of time? And even okay. before that, how many and exactly which group of people are able to access that particular pedagogical space, which is full of flaws? So even the current pedagogical spaces, you know, when if we talk about India and how hierarchical it is, how curriculum based is it, and things like how 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 knowledge and education is kind of determined by what the ruling regime wants, what the regimes prior to that wanted, and it is so much, uh, it, it is filled in a certain box and it is defined by a certain framework. So anyway, the in, existing uh, uh, pedagogical space is full of flaws, but even that flawed version is out of access of mm -hmm. so many people. And mm -hmm. this is a global phenomenon. It's not, uh, it, it, it can be seen across countries. And I, as I was reading, and I was talking about this very uh, amazing book that I've been reading uh, latestly by Michael Sandel, uh, mm -hmm. his book, The Tyranny of Merit, What Becomes of the Common Good, where mm -hmm. he sees how uh, people, those who have enormous resources with them, they have mm -hmm. enormous resources with them to do literally anything other than education, mm -hmm. also want a degree from an Ivy League or a Harvard. Mm -hmm. Hence, mm -hmm. Harvard and Ivy League are not only giving spaces for employment, but that's kind of a badge. That's kind of a badge of recognition. That's kind of a prestige that people really want to acquire because if it was only mm -hmm. about you no know, getting employed making money then they would no rather join the family uh, businesses and then pursue that but along with family businesses they want a degree from this uh, these particular colleges and uh, he mentioned uh, uh, extremely shocking facts about how 77 percent you know of the population uh, sorry uh, how the the lower section of the population has chances which is 77% less than the topmost 3% who can own uh, this education. And actually, yeah, the word is own over here because it is not dependent on who wants to study or no, it is clearly dependent on how one can access it. Coming to the Indian yeah. context, it is very much divided on a lot many variations on the basis of caste, class, gender, mm -hmm. on the basis of region that one, one person comes from. So, for example, mm -hmm. if we even talk about Delhi University as a yeah, space, yeah. it has several colleges. So it has around 60 colleges and every college is so different from the other one. It is mm -hmm. so divided and we can see the divide within this uh, one university itself where something like a Stephens is providing mm -hmm. quality education with good infrastructure 
and with good amount of investment in research. But some college know in the off-campus spaces at South Campus maybe they do not have the kind of infrastructure. They do not have the kind of education that you know they uh, they need to get at the university. So even at the university level, the colleges are divided into so I mean. On the basis of such massive inequality, it becomes very difficult for people you know, to leave their spaces, come out of the out of indigenous or rural spaces and get admission into a city like Delhi and then you know, yeah, yeah. think of how uh, we're going to make out of it. And uh, the sad part is that uh, uh, the sector of education, which should have been prioritized by governments, by successive governments over time, is the sector which is given least importance, at least in India, at this particular position of time. And uh, over now, around uh, past five to six years, we have seen how there has been a direct onslaught on A, the idea of university, and B, on some specific universities. So mm -hmm. research and development is something that we really, really requires funding, and it re really requires support from the state uh, and the society. But the mm. government has seriously cut, I have, you know, have pulled off uh, waivers and grants from research and from higher education. Mm. And um, yeah, so even the basic fellowships that you no know, students have earned by working so hard is, is, is not being given to them. There is complete saffronization of education taking place where the curriculum and syllabus, which was already, you know, having a lot of flaws is being changed now. Several chapters important to caste, uh, in, uh, which is important in regards of peasants and other social movements have been removed from CBSE. And that's the kind of education they want uh, the new generation to take. Yeah. At, the, uh, at the higher education level as well, there are so many important works of important authors that we really need to study, which have been deleted, eliminated from the syllabus itself. So mm -hmm. a huge saffronization is happening. There has been a huge mm -hmm. cut in the amount of funding and grants, which is you know, uh, allocated for the education sector. And moreover, the second kind of onslaught is very, is, is kind of linked to the national public culture that is taking place, which is communal and casties mm -hmm. and, and, and Brahminical. Mm -hmm. Well, not mm -hmm. only the idea of university is targeted, but certain universities are shamed as quote unquote anti-national, as quote unquote, no. Yeah. And, and they, they become targets of a larger Islamophobic culture, a larger patriarchal communal culture where we saw how in 2016, JNU was attacked that way. And quote unquote, it mm -hmm. was you no know, kind of uh, given a label of anti-national, and you no, know, mm -hmm. it was shamed in a manner where you no know, people would really consider the university as dangerous. And many mm -hmm. bright students who actually wanted to go over there could not even take admission because of that kind of an image that you no know, the mainstream media created for the university. This time, mm -hmm. when the CA protests were happening the same model mm -hmm. was applied but with a communal angle to it where the Jamia Milia Islamia and Aligarh Muslim University were attacked because of being a religious minority and for the first time in the history of this country the libraries mm -hmm. were also uh, attacked and the police actually went inside and uh, we, we saw it you know in the videos and yeah, yeah. the sad part is how the case is proceeding after it so the yeah, university yeah. spaces is because these are the spaces which could provide a critical uh, engagement. Mm -hmm. These are the spaces which provide some level of hope, uh, mm -hmm. despite the severe inherent flaws in it, are constantly mm -hmm. under attack by uh, ruling regimes. And mm -hmm. it, it is a global mm -hmm. phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, you brought up like a, a, a couple of uh, points, right? I mean, that's quite a broad sort of scope of the way, uh, you know, uh, education has been set up. We, uh, you know, caste is, you know, perhaps one of the most oppressive uh, kinds of social ordering, which is also, uh, you know, I mean, we don't speak of it. Uh, there's, uh, you know, almost, I mean, you, you grow up in this country and there's, uh, you know, it's it's just an implicit part of your uh, identity, un, you know, um, and quite insidious. And then there's the layer of class and oftentimes a conflation of class and caste when actually they're two different things, you know. Uh, and then of course there is gender. Uh, and we'll come to also like some of the research that you're doing with caste and gender in terms of the academic space. But, uh, you know, I mean, I think 
one of the things that you pointed out even with um, the idea of meritocracy uh, is uh, also the neoliberalization of educational systems, right? So uh, when you talk about the shaming of universities, right, to sort of pick on, uh, say, JNU and say that's anti-national, uh, there's a fear, uh, right, that that comes out of, of, of you know, if you, if you were to graduate from there or if you are present in that space, um, as opposed to, you know, maybe other kinds of universities like Ajindal or Shivnadar even, you know, but, uh, and, and the, you, you can see the difference in terms of also how you are being politicized because one of the things that uh, often um, you know we speak about is the even the physical infrastructure of universities like the way that a university is built right so oftentimes um, universities were built with big campuses right and now they're kind of like very uh, the newer universities are like just building so you don't and the way you also structure the syllabus is such that you don't actually get to form the kind of bonds and relationships with each other to understand because where does I mean the politics is also sort of you know referring to what um, uh, the undercommons which I think we've also shared like a a common interest in and we've engaged with the that text you know um what what uh, actually Morton and Hani also talk about is uh, actually this idea of how um where are the spaces for us to kind of come together for true learning to be able to empathize to be able to love right and so that doesn't work for capital that doesn't work for neoliberalism and so you know you have to um kind of ensure that there that kind of coming together does not happen so we don't really understand uh what our positionalities are what are spaces of privilege not just as okay you are privileged and i'm not privileged but then what do you do with that right what is how do you form allyships and solidarities what does giving space and taking space mean because i think we all have the language i oftentimes think we have the language and we understand it and also think about i mean because i'm trying to think about you know what becomes um the alternative then right because on the one hand depending on the intersections of various marginalities, maybe getting into a university is about emancipation, is uh, about liberation, right? And at the same time, that same university space is going to be oppressive and violent and silences you. And then there are all of these other kinds of, you know, alternative spaces that are kind of coming up, but that's also oftentimes you know, um, set up by people who come from, you know, like a much more privileged backgrounds. Like, you know, I always joke that I've gone through all of this Western education and then kind of, you know, come to setting up like the school of IO, which is about unlearning. But, you know, oftentimes you can just do it and it's very tokenistic or you're actually replicating uh, nothing alternative, you're replicating a system. So, you know, like uh, Morton and Hani talk, are critical of the, uh, the figure of... Um, the critical academic you know so how you can be within the institution you can be critical but you are recognized by and by the institution yeah, right exactly and and that contradiction and that tension what do we do with it right so which is why we need like the tearing down of systems so the more mm -hmm. abolitionist view rather than the reformation kind of view, you know, like the complete annihilation, right? That's, it is about abolition in a way. Yeah. And, and I, and it's also interesting about how um, universities are also spaces which turns insurgents into, you know, agents of the state, which is also something that comes up in the undercommon, right? And I thought that very interesting because you're kind of even taking what can be yeah. very political, but you're, it's it's sort of you know it becomes something else. You no, know? people just end up have become career politicians or something, right? And so I, I'm trying to see. Um, maybe my question is also you know uh, just just that like how what does alternative mean then in, in in all of this? You know, in our context. Yeah. So uh, when you said no, how uh, the uh, 
how critical academicians uh, no kind of mean critique by stefano hane and fred morten and so that's mm -hmm. why i really like you no know, when they say that uh, the only relationship we can have with the university is a criminal one and we go over there and steal yeah. ideas <laughs> so yeah. even when you yeah. have built you know the io school and when the other people are also you know uh, um, engaging with alternative pedagogical spaces something is there mm -hmm. which we actually bought from the university and we we actually yeah. got you no know, this idea also you know at some level from the university itself and then we kind of built it with other experiences mm -hmm. ideas and it mm -hmm. kind of you no know, enters into a bigger project so i think that mm -hmm. could surely be one point where everybody uh, you know is kind of uplifted so that people have mm -hmm. the access to university but we don't mm -hmm. go over there you no know, just to get absorbed by its dictates but we kind mm -hmm. of you no know, engage in an under common project of surround and you no know, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, chapter 0 uh, talks about that about politics mm -hmm. around it where surround is not kind of mm -hmm. bordering around a particular object or a particular subject but surround mm -hmm. as an idea is about openness and no it's mm -hmm. about how we engage in a very different mode of living so when mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. use the under common project of surround at a university then it would mean that we are going into a university entering there to use the university against it so we are not mm -hmm. going to really submit to the university and its dictates the bureaucracy the administration the hierarchy that it perpetuates and that it wants to be reproduced time again and again but rather uh, coming out of it but for that also i think going to the university <laughs> for a moment becomes yeah. must and then no maybe returning back to other spaces so in this yeah. regards i also would like to highlight you no know, uh, linda zerilis you no know, uh, idea of critique mm. so when we go mm. in the university when we think about an alternative pedagogical space there we are doing one act of criticizing of critique uh, of the existing mm -hmm. status quo uh, quest, uh, situation so linda zerilee mm -hmm. talks about how critique has to be dislocated from the shackles of academic yeah. confinement to of professional thinkers to uh, to political space to a public domain and know where we actually practicing mm -hmm. it and if i could relate mm -hmm. to this then i think the current farmers movement is also something like yeah. this yeah. it's critical yeah. Yeah. it is uh, revolutionary in the sense that the farmers have just you know they came you know from punjab and other spaces and they did not worry about even their life they have actually kept their life at stake and they just went against the government they may not have been taught in university spaces but the amount of critique and the amount of strength that they represent is way more than an academic professional also you know at the university space Mm -hmm. and where the professional would actually be you no know, criticizing government's actions and policies and everything but what has happened on ground is something which came out of a person who never went to the university yeah so mm -hmm. it it is also you no know, like very clearly it shows about that and uh, in, not just in india there has been something called uh, Uh, an idea which banu bargu in her book star and emulate the politics of human weapon think... talks about uh, negro resistance uh this uh, someone out on the door i'll just oh, no. tell them to sure sure yeah 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 no problem it. no problem just a minute yeah <laughs> mummy मम्मी बात में करना पीसीए अभी मैं कोई या सो आई आई बिगिन विद व्हाई शुड आई बिगिन फ्रॉम दैट्स ओके गो अहेड या या यू वर सेइंग ओके so yeah so uh, i was talking about banu bargu's work called uh, starve and emulate yeah. the politics of human weapon where she talks about an idea called negro resistance now this is quite different from mm -hmm. farmers protest but what she meant by negro resistance was you no know, something uh, which happened in early 2000s in turkey and it is also happened in ireland i suppose and what happened was that the prisons uh, the uh, the the administration in the prison department of turkey they came up with a new uh, law where they would not allow where they would no isolate prisoners 
and they would be confined into their small mm. prison cells so all prisoners for seven mm. years came up on a death fast and that was like wow. actually actually you know i mean they knew that they're going to die out of it but it was only to take mm. those uh, you know laws which used to isolate prisoners uh, i mean they, it was only for the abolition of a certain law and the demand was just to be mm. together they did not wanted to they never wanted to be in isolated prisons because together they could mm. know uh, engage in an act of resistance and they were resisting it together but even when they were mm. isolated they kind of came up with the idea of a death fast and they would have some timetables so everyone would follow the timetable very strictly so they would wake up early morning and you know do uh, other course and then they would engage in reading and other things like that so even when they were isolated mm -hmm. in different prisons when they had no contact with each other they were kind of working together just because of those mm -hmm. tables of because of the death fast so it was an act mm -hmm. of resistance together that was happening so what mm -hmm. uh, what that also highlights is that the idea of critique who was kind of dislocated from the academic shackles to something at a mm. you no know, at at a down at a level of praxis at the level of ground and so mm. that becomes important and um, even uh, fred morton and stefano hane you know uh, the kind of you no know, criticizes mm. how academic professionalization is the privatization of the social individual and that's so true yes. and uh, yeah, as a student exactly. in the university i can absolutely feel that no how the most critical yeah. minds are kind of no institutionalized in a certain framework and they are in yeah. a constant negotiation and uh, mm. with negotiation mm -hmm. i don't think so the structure is going to be affected the structure would like some negotiation to happen for its own existence mm. so mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah and i think that's so uh, i mean that's that's like such a relevant point you know because this kind of coming together uh otherwise you know just also uh places of study so like as you said you know even uh within many protests as of late like in uh, you know the kind of participation that's also happened uh in a way perhaps it hasn't happened for a, a while within different class and caste structures you know the way uh you know protests had also become spaces of learning and it has nothing to do with it it's just that learning is it's kind of like study right like when morton yeah. says we are in a classroom it's the chaos before the class is in order that um is where like the actual learning takes place you know and i think even when we were communicating um there was uh damn i'm not sure if i lost you is it fine i think my ah yeah you are there okay so uh so you were able to hear Yes, I, I was able to okay. hear you. The video got freezed. Just okay, okay, cool. And uh, so you know, like even when you said that when you kind of go into university and all of you meet mm -hmm. and you talk for hours and you don't realize like how time passes by, and then to also relate it to what you said, right? Like just uh, this, this sort of like coming together of prisoners or the coming together of farmers and you know the your learning ideas around what community organizing strategizing. uh speaking you know being together like you know there is care there are many kinds of infrastructures of care over there and mm -hmm. and to also remember for us now in the middle of a pandemic which is huge i mean by a fascist government it has been weaponized and there have been ways in which many are continued to be silenced uh and yet there is the surge of kind of you know um showing up uh right and and so i think uh, i'm i'm kind of interested in that idea of like a being together otherwise you know and and how to sort of capture these different moments because i also uh you know thought of resistance in a different way right like mm -hmm. i when we sort of think that sometimes there's resistance even in a whatsapp group with family you know uh it's it's you know what does it mean to sort of and scales of these participations right there is something because i think um, one of the things that we also uh, talked about with shaheen bag for for instance right uh, to be conscious of how we enter and leave that space right because there are certain kinds of things like if you 
were, you know, religious, caste-based sort of identities that protected you. So you could enter, leave anytime you wanted, but it wasn't the same for other bodies that are present there, right, in a sense. And so what are you taking? What are you giving, you know, and, and how to be conscious of those things? Like, what does it actually mean to say that this is my community, right? Mm-hmm. Because it might not be, but how do you participate while sort of uh, not sort of, you know, reducing it to identitarian politics in a sense, you know, if that makes sense. But but I've been really thinking about this being together otherwise because within it sits like a lot of antagonisms and contradictions, right? And yeah. that's something I'm interested in because you want to be something and then you're actually, you don't know, right? It's not just good. It's not enough to be like a good person with good intentions, <laughs> right? Um, and so... Yeah, so I was just one. I mean, wondering if you could kind of, yeah, what your thoughts were about, you know, antagonisms and contradictions, because it's a question that keeps coming up, especially when we're mm. trying to build solidarities, allyship, create spaces of learning, you know. Yeah, so um, uh, I, I see antagonisms and contradictions in two sense. First is a clear antagonism, a clear contradiction between uh, the resisting mm. power and the ruling power. And uh, in this point, I would also like to connect it to something that we've discussed earlier. So um, academia and academic professionalization kind of instills in us a certain sense of critique. It instills in us no certain sense of understanding things about how to know understand the real intentions, know and what is actually mm-hmm. being done by the by the government, by the ruling oppressive powers, and so on. Mm-hmm. But Criticism also has a certain limit after all. Mm -hmm. There is a government which is openly communal, which is clearly saying that we want to build the Ram Mandir and we are going to know, uh, literally they're giving genocidal calls on the basis of religious minority and they actually, you know, uh, uh, burn houses of Dalits. They, you know, uh, the, uh, the kind of atrocities that Dalit women face is so high. And the the government themselves and their ministers kind of, know, come and say how rapes could be protected if you, you know, give some kind of moral behavior to women and things like that. And this same government has been anti-women, anti-Muslim and anti-Dalit. There is no no hiding in it. It's not as if they are internally, you know, behaving this way and there's something different on the outside. No. They were clear, it was there in the mandate that Article 370 would have would be abolished. It was clear in the mandate that Ram Mandir would be built. So when the government and the ruling power is openly racist, openly communal, Islamophobic, casties, when it's open about all these malicious intention, how do we engage with them by this idea of critiquing the government, you know, uh, as no academic professional, uh, professionals would say. So critique would become you no know, imminent when there's some change you know, on some level of moral ideas which the government follows. But the government itself says there is no moral ideals you know, that they follow. The only moral ideal is to build a Hindu Rashtra, for instance. So when they have yeah, a clear yeah. intention that our critique that we learn from the academic professionals kind of falls short uh, mm-hmm. while engaging with mm-hmm. people like this. And hence, you know, mm-hmm. becomes the very need of dislocating this entire idea into the public domain. And where, you no, know, we are, con- we have antagonism, we have contradictions, very clear contradictions with the government, but we're not only going to, you know, explain things to them because it you no know, kind of falls on deaf ear. And people who have mm-hmm. tried to explain are easily, you know, picked up and booked under extraordinary laws like UAP, NSA and things like that. It's been very clear. The one who looked at yeah. kind of questions government criticizes, you no, know, and all of them are facing this. So what new model of living and resisting can be formed? This is like a very important question that, and it's a very urgent question that we really need to address. And it does not have any clear answers in one go mm. because it is kind of yeah. a process and it will take place only out of, you no. Know, experiences solidarity and actually experimenting you no know, on ground and obviously taking insights from the universities as well but the entire de- clear dependency on you know, an academic professional would you no know, kind of um kind of fall short of the goal so this mm-hmm. is kind of you know a process that really needs to be reworked relooked yeah. at and you no know, it needs constant experimentation and 
yeah. uh, related to this is another kind of antagonism which we sometimes face face within the social movement itself so for example mm -hmm. uh, when i go to campus and you know, everybody uh, there, there are a group of there are various groups of people and everybody is against the government but with why being against the government every human has his or her own you know understanding of how and in which manner are we supposed to rise against the government so there are differences even within the um, uh, social movement itself but what happens is yeah. when some particular person take the charge of the movement you know and when they kind of dictate what is right or wrong and they kind of you no know, give labels to others you no know, and then they they get you no know, uh, into a very hostile behavior shaming and things like mm -hmm. that you know and yes. where the debate wouldn't be on the basis of arguments but no before you utter something you'll be labeled no in a certain sense oh you're yeah. liberal or you're this you're that and it ends there so it does not end up into no a very constructive uh, debate so this kind of no rigidity uh, which no kala bergman and nick montgomery in the mm -hmm. book joyful militancy say call it out as rigid radicalism is also problematic mm -hmm. because it is kind of weakening mm -hmm. us uh weakening us as a force against the government itself against the ruling power itself it is kind of weakening the movement from within it's kind of a process of decaying decaying within because we're not respecting the others ideas and i think it is very important to understand that whatever goal that we are kind of imagining at this particular point of time will have multiple ways to achieve it and maybe mm -hmm. it might be a product of multiple understandings and things like that and it mm -hmm. really needs a constant experimentation yeah. and what we today imagine may not be something that we want after some point of time when mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. have actually you know in that process of revolution itself mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we have to know really uh, consider this fact that there is a lot of space for improvisation and there's a lot of space which requires constant working rather than some you no know, dictate which is predetermined yeah. yeah yeah and you know i mean it i'm also thinking about uh, because when when i first actually came across your writing it was about on peria right and uh, also about it you know uh, and he's such a particular figure because i also saw a lot of like left liberal intellectuals who would embrace ambedkar but would be very critical of periyar and you know uh, and and i think there was a lot of misreading as well of of his stance because he can be uh you know it's it's in, in the way that he might have presented some of his you know ideas but i but you know i mean i i've really been sitting with these ideas of of just within the left right the antagonisms and contradictions mm -hmm. because it's always easy to sort of look at of course you know the mm -hmm. the right and and you know it's and the bucks and the sanghis and all of that and it's of course it's important but you know like even for me when i participated in the me too movement right um there were so many different ways of because you would think we would all come together in different ways because we're all fighting for somewhat the same thing but of course you know there is on the one hand the savarna feminists uh, you know sort of appropriating or erasing um dalit feminists you know there is uh, the trans um a uh, chance folks you know and and their sort of like uh, work that has also of course you know uh, been erased and and also uh, the conversation of visibility right i mean sometimes visibility can actually lead to uh, lynching and death and murder and that's not that's different from being uh, visible in the lens of just uh, you know just the 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 sort of marginality of, of being a woman but if you're cis and hetero then you know what Uh, it's a different kind of visibility you're seeking which might not be what uh, someone else's visibility uh, might mean for them in terms of emancipation or uh, or liberation right um and and i think i'm interested in how you how we would even speak to bringing these narratives right like periyar in terms of he also talked about community cooking right mm -hmm. i mean and we i mean it is about a coming together uh, in a way right so there are certain aspects that are quite important in these in these figures that are not embraced because they seem to be problematic um you know uh, and 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 i think one of the things that um, morton and hani ashi talk about is also the 
opting out of um, politics, right? So I think there's, uh, it, I mean, they talk about the failure of politics, actually speaking to what you were saying. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I I lost the network. Uh, oh, the okay. Were you were you able yeah. to hear the part about the failure of uh, politics? Um, I I could hear till the uh, till the point on community cooking. Ah, uh, community cooking. Yeah. No. So I was I was interested in yes. I mean, uh, certain kinds of figures towards whom there are you know. Uh, not a full embracing of in terms of their ideology, but they are anti-caste, for example, they are feminists, they are revolutionary, but, you know, um, and they, but, you know, that, that kind of antagonism within the left as well, uh, which is, or oh, within whatever we're opposing, right, and who is this, yeah. us who are embracing this, but even to define that body politic, um, I was talking about uh, uh, Moten and Hani and how they talk about opting out of politics, you know, if if we were to sort of talk of our subjectivity, right, in, in this frame, if we opt out of politics, what it means is that, uh, and I'll quote them, uh, we surround democracy's false image in order to unsettle it. Every time it tries to enclose us in a decision, we are undecided. Every time it tries to represent our will, we are unwilling. And every time it tries to take root, we are gone because we're already here moving. And I'm kind of interested in being, you know, like what it means to be that figure, right? Because even democracy is extremely flawed. If democracy is the only option, mm. fascists call democracy, democracy, but we're within a fascist state, right? So democracy is the only logical sort of option that we have that could be a space of equality is actually, mm also kind of flawed um in in some ways right so yeah. how would so how do what do we do with that and i was kind of interested in in your thoughts because i know there was another interview where you kind of also mentioned how um uh you know the the, the kind of representation that happens in student politics also mm -hmm. within the university yeah. is reflective of national politics in a sense you know um and and then within the university space, the fact that women, uh, you know, are very much completely, uh, don't have the agency or uh, the, you know, um, the, the ability to vote and participate yeah. is already saying something and setting certain parameters. And I think maybe it could be interesting to relate it to, I know the research that you're doing within mm -hmm. gender and caste as well within academia. So I don't know if that's like, too much but I think hopefully like I think the those connections could be very interesting like the the micro the macro and then you know these sort of elements the opting out of politics so do we create something else like wh how do you what would that be like you know hmm. yeah so I'll, I'll begin by um no the take when you uh when you started about how there are flaws within the current understanding of democracy as well and uh, mm -hmm. uh, so what we have right now is no very clear utilitarian principle that we follow and it is the greatest happiness of the greatest number so the hindus <laughs> so which are in the majority and caste hindus and no and and then the brahmanical system and all of that so it kind of no is working hand in hand for each other and it is uh, clearly following the principle of uh, how no democracy is actually no uh, yeah. what the majority wants yeah. and this kind and it is actually a result the flaws that we are seeing is a result of the majority decision mm -hmm. obviously this yeah. current ruling regime was voted into power and uh, we, we saw what no we are currently facing mm -hmm. um so that that is definitely a problem at a mm -hmm. national level that we're seeing and it percolates at the student politics at the university level as well. And for example, if I have to take Delhi University's uh, case, so Delhi University Student Union uh, no, uh, conducts its annual elections and it is the largest election in the country. And it kind of reflects how the, you know, the model of politics that we have at nat national level, where the seats from the major dominant parties are given to people coming from a certain caste. Mm. And they actually buy buy the uh, the tickets uh, of it, and 
many of them no in fact enroll in a university with the only objective to be a career politician no and then to get into you know from the student wings of abvp and ns where they would you know get into bjp and congress later and that's how you know, the procedure has been there mm -hmm. and uh strikingly when while the country you know as a country we have the universal adult franchise you no know, being practiced where everybody has the right to vote when you no know, a person is beyond 18 years but women from women colleges in uh, delhi university a lot of them except just two or three do not have the right to vote because the college is not a part of do so so what it means is that they can neither contest elections nor can they vote so when the women colleges which are already like around 18 to 19 number and you have excluded so many of them only you know with the pretext of saying that uh, uh, the uh, campus space would you know be spoiled if we allow kind of some kind of politics you know to take place over here so it is a clear indication you no know, where they saying that okay so you are in a women college so you just go over there study and get back to you know your career your home or be good wise quote and quote and that yeah. was the actually the logic you no know, when uh, university education for women started and you no know, how mm -hmm. um, a certain i think in 80s and mm -hmm. 70s how you no know, uh, women from you no know, a richer background would be enrolled in college like lsr just mm -hmm. to be good wives you no know, and just to attend you know those uh, uh, this was you no know, the uh, uh, the kind of image which was projected in front of uh, uh, of people and that was you no know, how even while you giving education to a person you have a certain idea of what is she going to do with the education mm -hmm. so you mm -hmm. have enrolled her in the university but both the university and the society knows that you no know, no matter how much education she receives but she has some other work to be done and her education should be in line with that and this is very clear so for example something like bachelors in education no uh, this is a degree which is required for teaching in school from class 1 to 8 it's a course mm -hmm. provided at delhi university at undergraduate level only mm -hmm. in women colleges so it is a clear indication so when you going to teach in school is only the women mm -hmm. were going to teach no yeah, yeah, at school yeah, because yeah, of yeah. nurturing and care and know mm -hmm. how the feminization of labor would take place and all of that mm -hmm. so it begins from the mm -hmm. university itself and uh, when i contested for this uh, election it was a tough time mm -hmm. but then i learned a lot and it was also no it was no really me participating i mean when i was in undergrad i was in a women's college and i could yeah. not participate in the election either vote nor contest and when i joined in a coed education at masters level i could then participate in it and then i contest for the election it was actually you know a feeling of freedom uh, an experience mm. of freedom so from the confinement mm. of academia which i was you know engaged in and even now i am engaged in academics but now with a different approach with a different perspective altogether mm. but then when i entered in this new phase i felt like a participant Mm. until now within the academic confinement it it felt as if i knew things i knew certain information i knew certain ideas how to criticize the government how to know uh, think about in terms of you no know, linguistics in terms of some content in terms of curriculum but mm -hmm. i wasn't participating and when yeah. i entered into that in that public domain it was really you no know, all these ideas which i had now could be executed on the ground and then obviously experimented mm -hmm. so yeah so that is you no know, one experience that i had you no know, where i could really mm -hmm. take and dislocate you no know, my ideas from academic confinement to the university space mm -hmm. and and so how does the research with gender and caste that you doing i mean even if i mean if you want to briefly like talk about that in some yeah. ways like is has that shifted and changed in a way for you uh over the course of doing that work um you know because i mean i think that's also kind of important you know uh, in a sense uh, i was interested in the uh, in the protest the anti abortion protest that were happening in yeah. poland uh, which is not really there's a an article in jacobin which is you know really sort of focusing on how it's not really just uh, uh you know about abortion but it's actually also touching upon uh this one key difference which I, it really stood out which was that how a women's uh, strike is different from a worker strike in the sense yeah. that when we have a worker strike you it's to say yes you know if 
people were to stop picking up the garbage, if people were to stop uh, cleaning or, you know, or going into factories, then capitalism, like the break is put on that because the workers are not present. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just going to stop just as, you know, one might even say about certain, you know, protests with, with farmers. Right? You're, you're, I mean, where are you getting your food from? Like, you know, if let's just see if they're all out there. So, but with women, um, a women's strike is essentially not even about stopping the labor. It's about recognizing the labor that you've been doing as work, right? Mm -hmm. In the sense, like that care and, um, and you know, the, the kind of, because it's also interesting because up until gender studies, like feminism uh, was, was a very different thing. Uh, and, and the kind of shift towards a neoliberal feminism really also mm -hmm. does happen because of academia and this kind of um, the, the framing of gender studies, right? Mm -hmm. Because then what happened, and this is what uh, Lola Olufemi talks about in Feminism Interrupted, you know, where suddenly you have moved, you have waves of feminism and then you uh, talk about feminism like it was mostly like white middle-class women when actually it erased the work of indigenous and black British feminists, right? Um, yeah. And, and she talks about how there was uh, a, a, a panel or an event and this this older black uh, woman sort of came and was part of the audience and then she just mm -hmm. stood up in tears and said, you know, all that you've been talking about, it's what I used to talk with my grandmother on the dinner table, but you've, you've given it a voice, you've recorded it, you've written about it. And she was so moved by that, you know, so even black studies, for example, or any sort of these, these sort of movements that happened, right? Um, Anti-caste, like it's not something that emerges out of a university, it's that the university takes it on and then there's that, you know, the whole sort of uh, whatever antagonism within that. So, you know, so I'm kind of interested then, like when you're speaking of gender and caste and that research, like how how is that framing working out for you, you know? Yeah, so in this particular research, I'm trying to assess inclusivity in mm -hmm. uh, in curriculum and I'm trying to locate caste in gender studies because what we have seen is that there's a clear neglect of anti-caste intellectuals in gender studies, mm -hmm. no? And there's no recognized recognition given to anti-caste intellectuals as someone who have been pioneering, no, the cause of gender justice and women's rights. And uh, yeah. take example of Phule, uh, Sabitri by yes. Phule, take example of Jyoti by Phule, Periyar, Ayuti Thas, no, B.R. Ambedkar, or they have been seen as leaders, no, uh, as Dalit leaders, but they have yeah. equally been, no, uh, have been contributing for the cause of women rights as well. And uh, they have been national leaders as well, and also international leaders, no, if I have to mm -hmm. say that mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about oppression, when we talk about solidarity and things like that. But what mm -hmm. happens is that there's a very systematic approach know in which the academia also kind of functions so what so they kind of first reduce a person you know with uh, to a dalit leader and then say yeah. caste is a non issue so yeah. you're going to reduce it only to caste and then no it say that it does not exist so even that reduction you no know, of you no know, what uh, people do uh, is kind of uh, eliminated again further um, yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can hear you. That yeah. Is, yeah, so even that is now eliminated further. And um, in this particular research, I have no look, tried to know uh, at Delhi University, there, there are various subjects, various no, uh, courses provided by various faculties and faculty of arts and faculty of social sciences no, provides no, the liberal arts subject. So I have been assessing six subjects, uh, basically philosophy, psychology, English, political science, sociology, and history, and I, I, I did textual analysis, the curriculum that they have given on mm -hmm. the papers related to gender studies. And I tried to locate, you know, how much proportion was given to caste? Was it seen as a framework uh, for all the topics? Was the issue of caste linked to all the themes or was it limited to some one particular section? Were the uh, works of, you know, from Dalit feminists and Dalit authors included in it or not? So there were things, uh, mm -hmm. so this was a rough framework in which I uh, worked. And then I realized that curriculum can be visualized mm -hmm. as a space. So mm -hmm. as we visualize the city as a space of socio-political economic relations, the same 
thing can be visualized on the very first page of the syllabus where mm. those who are at the margins of the society are at the margins of the curriculum mm. and okay. what happens now very strikingly is that the university system is based on semesters so it is no five six months you end up with one semester and then you have one another semester so the margins of the society which are represented the margins of the curriculum often fall at the last days of the semester and that is the time when everybody is lacking behind everybody is in a very huge rush to complete the syllabus so it kind of falls into place so already a really less attention is given to caste as a last topic and even mm -hmm. that last topic is dealt at the last point of the semester where where the teacher can manually not even give enough amount of attention to it so the mm -hmm. bureaucracy and the official rule which is very systematic so i mean it does not have a direct relation to caste as such mm -hmm. the semester mm -hmm. is that way but when you put mm -hmm. a certain thing at a certain point it mm -hmm. does a kind of an ordinal ranking so mm -hmm. even the syllabus and the curriculum no would end up being no uh, uh resulting into a kind of an ordinal ranking where they would place yes. topic so mm -hmm. now i might say you no know, it is not on the basis of importance so even if it is not on the basis of importance but some coincidence takes place every year where you no know, last topics last point of the time yeah. Mm. as and you no know, it is um, and this is also a lot of politics of important topics quote and quote mm -hmm. of important topics and mm. how students visualize what is important and what is mm. not important mm. Mm. the dominant perspective dominant paradigm which are so much full of flaws in the society are taught at the starting and yeah. people a lot of time in it so yeah. you kind of just teaching the dominant position but where to rectify you know what are the solutions that you're trying to engage solutions come at the last and the marginalized comes at the last so mm -hmm. how is the student uh, who you know is you not know, just oriented with that exam and syllabus to you know cover within those last one or two days you no know, would engage mm -hmm. in those topics mm -hmm. so you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of politics of curriculum that play takes place and we can see it as a space we can see at mm -hmm. as something which reinforces the inequalities of the society Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, that's it, it's also sort of I mean, I, I wonder like how you would think, you know, like bringing it also back to like the context of where we are now, you know, um, where we are sort of dealing with a, a, a public health crisis. Um, there's going to be issues of accessibility to even, um, you know, uh, to many things in, in a sense. And um, if if you were to sort of like actually imagine what another kind of space of learning can exist you know as you sort of you know you you are within academia but you know what does it mean to step out of it or be within it or you know uh, tear it down or you know going forward like i'm i'm kind of interested in in the politics of imagination as well because i think you know that's that's what you're denied right um going back to what you were saying in the beginning uh, of ivy leagues and access why um you know someone was just sort of saying you know it's just so funny that like all of the leaders are just you know the same thing i mean even even in obama is problematic you know i mean as much as he's charming and he he sort of like represented a certain kind or even kamala harris for now right like you know i mean it's just he she she's sort of incarcerated the most you know the, the a large number of of black men in the prison system while she was in um california right uh, the governor there so the thing is that this identitarian politics can be a uh, very um fraud and like this so, so you know i i wonder about imagining i wonder about our language i wonder uh, if you had the power to And just imagine in a very simple you know way the world going forward that would you could sort of like build what kind of space you could build right um to saying that kids there like the world we want is there you know i always do that when i i do my teaching i'm like you know we we kind of uh, in our writing workshops look at the cv you know and i talk about how the cv is such a great example of everything right it's it's um 
so even about getting into university like i feel like i had a cv before i even did anything you know like my my experiences came after but what i put in my cv had to do with my my caste privilege like to say i am so and so's daughter could get me like a job somewhere else you know how it works in india right like that's just so it's like who is your father and this very paternalistic thing it's always sort of passing on from certain male figures and their responsibility of of where we end up leading our lives and it's it's been you know you have to be conscious of it and then understand where you've come now and how but even leaders right they go to certain kinds of universities they are taught about policy they are taught about foreign policy the history of foreign policy is also interesting right in the language so when i did my thesis about which is centered on the work of an artist around afghanistan mm-hmm. um she was sort of uh, taking unfinished films from the afghan film archive and sort of you know created this documentary speaking to different people involved in in making the films and in the 80s when it was the communist regime in afghanistan uh and so also to sort of make a documentary that allows afghans to imagine something about their past that has been erased right um and especially in its rep- uh, in in the representation of an afghan identity in like say even films uh, or popular imagination right it's always the place where it's being bombed it's always where the terrorists come from whatever right um and and so it was it was kind of interesting because i looked at foreign policy so do you know like that so the words like savage and uncivilized come from policy it doesn't come from visual cultures you know it doesn't come from uh, a liberal art space so you know the words that we even use and we're deconstructing come from a language that was written by the colonial mind like say you know the white colonial men who because colonialism was also the largest enterprise and so you know it was about white men who traveled to other parts of the world traveled and chronicled what was there and when they didn't understand it they presented themselves as a paradigm of what is civilized of what is cultured right and then created these things where everything else was set against that so i didn't under- they don't understand frontier land tribes uh you know um how that works so it's all savage and and that's spilled into what you know what we study in in the liberal sort of uh, humanities or whatever you know so i so i'm quite fascinated by how much you don't even realize what controls the way we speak and articulate as well so so yeah i mean if if you could imagine another kind of space like give stemming out of this if we were to go forward and that could be you know uh a way to think about our first question of what education could be like and who it would be for like how would you how would you imagine it what would you build you know uh, it's, it's a very big big question and you don't have to have an answer but but you know somewhere like is there something that that that's been sort of percolating in your mind with all of the stuff that we've been reading and talking like you know but i mean would you consider still being with an academia would you consider you know is it politics or is it i mean it's not like written in stone but like you know is it is it just participating in movements to continue to write it could be simple things you know but would you would you feel like it would be something that holds that power you know yeah um sometimes i do feel you no know, as if like we are in, in a kind of an institutional tunnel and yeah. for example where you know we Uh, okay so the the entire idea of forts and prisons and universities all mm-hmm. i'm keeping it same <laughs> yes it is actually yeah. <laughs> they are built no by obviously these oppressive powers but they're not as sharp as we know sometimes consider them to be they lack yeah. a lot of no there are a lot of loopholes and they forget about certain things and i think that those nooks and corners no which they have kept open could be mm-hmm. those spaces you no know, where we enter no yeah without yeah. really you know showing our intentions or mm-hmm. <laughs> the first yes. go and then kind of you no know, decay that system from within that could right. be one mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. way of rupturing the entire you no know, institutional premise mm-hmm. and you know, and that is obviously not a work of one day or work yeah. of one person but so many people you know mm-hmm. a, so many you no know, people resisting in their own ways in multiple yeah. ways. yeah mm-hmm. sometimes no going insight through those loopholes through those no left spaces and then attacking it 
know how no uh, it is like no returning back to what we discuss of politics around it mm -hmm. and no mm -hmm. surrounding going to the university using it against it mm -hmm. and sometimes no and while we're using it against it we're also carrying some very important things which we could know use at a space outside the university mm -hmm. so i think no the, the the kind of space that we are trying to imagine mm -hmm. uh, uh, poses another question will mm -hmm. there be any space as such or mm -hmm. going to be an interface you no know, mm -hmm. kind of changing every time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? yeah yeah because yeah. If you imagine a space then that space would also have some limitation some boundary mm -hmm. but when mm -hmm. we are talking about an interface and you no know, we be kind of giving room to an understanding which is space less no in mm -hmm. a manner and it's based on our actions on our experiments and no yeah so absolutely clear answer but there are a lot there's a lot of room and a lot of yeah. engagement i would say yeah that. Yeah, no, that's perfect because it's also kind of what uh, Morten and Hari are saying. You no, know, in when you're opting out of something, is to say that we're always present, but we're always moving. And you know, like, like what you sort of spoke of in terms of the farmers' protests or a Shaheen Bag or you know what we've seen. Like there are there've been many things that have happened, or even within for me to participate within, like say, um, uh, you know, a Me Too movement. Like movements will have flaws. It'll have things that. but that's the beauty of it that it can be as you say i think that engagement is so important so i think that's far more valuable than just being like something that's just constant um you know like a space is something that's just yeah much more much more intuitive and you you also mentioned improvisation which i think i also kind of um like to sort of you know uh think through a lot so um but uh, yeah i mean i think you know we we kind of close close to the the one hour so i i want to sort of be able to um you know uh i don't know just you know any uh yeah thoughts i mean i think uh if if there were anything else you wanted to share dani like you know just um as as a closing cuz i mean i think for me education is as i said before is like inherently political it's deeply political like you know and um there's no way around that and so i think these conversations like you say are also what engagement is and mm. something happening here so for me it's kind of important to keep doing that so i was wondering how how you yeah if there was any closing thoughts at all <laughs> Oh, one closing thought that no, I would really like to say is no, no, whatever that we're trying to engage in with, no, is kind of in a spiral. So even this talk was in no, in a kind of spiral <laughs> where we would go back and forth, no, and yeah. we are kind of landed up where we started from, and yeah. this is no really bound to happen, and and that's very different, no, and it is kind of. Uh, this mode of functioning is very different from no a colonial mindset no which has a unilinear path no one point to begin no and one point or aim to end at mm -hmm. and that's so problematic you know i mean when we are just no kind of following certain path or certain direction because that gives no space to creativity no space uh, no no opportunity for no any anything new to take place and if you really want to know talk about democracy we also have to you know give away this idea of, mm -hmm. uh, of 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 a certain utilitarian of a certain unilinear pattern mm -hmm. to something which you no know, which breaks this this idea of directions and paths because that is problematic and the direction that we and uh, you know kind of imagine mm -hmm. could be something which the government can easily also spot mm -hmm. so we also have to you know engage in that game you no know, where uh, Uh, where we're not really revealing our ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah we're kind of also thinking. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So again, back to know that constant experimentation thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah, that's that's great, and thank you so much. It's been uh, it's been a good first conversation. So I think of oh well, I mean, a, an actual face to face over Zoom. Yeah. But um, I know that there are texts and other things that you've shared, which um, are also just. hopefully things we can engage with 
uh, as we go forward. But thanks so much, Dani. Uh, I appreciate you spending the time here uh, doing this. Actually, I mean, like, uh, it was so engaging. And, you know, when I was, I mean, uh, since past few days, I was so stressed uh, because of, you know, again, academia and academia yeah. kind of, you know, has extraordinary and extreme potential to give depression to any uh, <laughs> any person. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I had deadlines and you know, I also have exams, you no. Know, Mm -hmm. and uh, papers to submit and things like that and I was so yeah. much occupied with it but when I now return to these texts these philosophical texts that I'm studying these days when I return to joyful militancy or mm -hmm. you know, when I'm reading uh, Steph Nohani's work it does not feel like a normal curriculum it does not feel yeah. burdening it kind of no mm -hmm. and it's uh, the very um I act no I mean the very moment when we read you know these texts it it is so relatable and mm -hmm. it just goes in the head. It just, no, it, it, it does. Yeah. And we don't really have to pressurize, no, ourselves to yeah. learn it or think uh, mm -hmm. about it. But it's so, yeah. And that shows how relatable it is. So, mm, yeah. So engaging and, uh, yeah. And kind of really eased me and made me, you know, uh, go back to a comfortable zone in which mm -hmm. I was before these, you no know, stressful mm -hmm. uh, days. So, yeah, yeah. I no, love good to, no. that I had <laughs> today. Yeah, yeah. I think you'll really enjoy Mark Fisher's capitalist realism because everything you just described about the universe yeah. and the kind of leading to depression actually is mm -hmm. what he talks about in capitalist realism that, you know, our mental health um, is uh, also driven by a very, uh, a certain mm -hmm. capitalist system which also exists within the university where you constantly... Um, feel like you can't imagine uh, the end of capitalism. You can't, you're always hooked onto the matrix, you know, even the larger capitalist system is taking over your imagination or your consciousness. So you you are kind of becoming this uh, agent of, of, of whatever the, the new liberal capitalist system needs you to be. So it's all quite related and, um, and, and it's, it's really kind of, uh, I think I read somewhere, it's some meme, but, uh, uh, on Instagram, which is sort of like, it's this account called Saved by the Bell Hooks, which is great. And it sort of says, you know, like no philosophy or theory is um, uh, it's, is worth anything if you can't have it as part of a daily conversation.